All right. So welcome everybody to the third talk in a series of talks related to the project Transmuting the Trumpocalypse. Um, this is the third but likely not the final talk we will ever do on some of the themes uh, related to this project because we've been having great conversations so far and also have uh, heard from various people that they want wanted to be a part but would would prefer to do a future talk so that's going to be fun um yeah we're going to look more into that but as for tonight um the third the third of these talks the topic is collective realization um and i want to open by providing a little bit of a definition for that term because uh i've heard some interesting stories about how that title for a talk has been um confusing or has caused some some misunderstanding as to kind of how I was intending it. So um, the names of the, the, the themes of the talks so far have been life power, meme power, and this third one, collective realization. At first we were calling it collective power, but um, I wanted to change it to realization, um, not in the sense of realization like um, consciousness, like when you become aware of something, um, and not in the sense either of, you know, uh, like self-actualization or self-realization or that there's some maybe perfect form of collective humankind that could be realized um, through just some kind of discursive or, you know, inner process kind of a set of work. Rather, I meant it in the sense, um, kind of a more literal sense of realization, um, in the sense of real making, <laughs> uh, at the intersection of life power and idea power, what is possible? What can be made real? Um, in the sense that, you know, our, our myths and stories about the things that we believe in and that motivate us and, and the kind of identities or ideologies that we, that we subscribe to, um, those affect the actions we take in the world. And at that intersection of, you know, uh, life power and consciousness and um, the stories we tell ourselves, you know, what effects can that have? The effects that, the effects that, that our stories can have in the real world are profound. Um, humans uh, have modified the environment profoundly so uh, beyond any other species and, and that has everything to do with you know um, how we use technologies and how we use ideas to act in the world and so what can we make real um, at this intersection um, so what stories would we like to make real in the world what aspects of ourselves would we like to amplify um, what would we like to uh, bring into manifestation that is currently laying dormant and what would we like to uh, set dormant <laughs> that is currently manifest so you know what um, and I, I talk about this in the pieces in terms of what memes uh, are no longer serving us and like broken tools or obsolete tools we need to drop in order to create the space to uh, look at different ways of being um, so uh, yeah those are kind of the orienting ideas for this talk. Okay, so Caroline, um, I'll just mention that we're recording this live and just the moment you started, I switched over and I looked at the attendees and I saw five attendees and I thought, oh, we were leaving these people out. Uh, and then two seconds later, I looked again and there were zero, but then a minute later I looked and there was Adam. So um, before we go on, I think we should welcome Adam into the conversation and uh, this will be actually my first time meeting him. Uh, I know you, we both know, uh, and have spoken in an event like this with John and TJ. Uh, we also have Kriti listening. And so I, I think just to step back from what you've laid out in terms of what collective realization means and why we're discussing it, let's welcome Adam and and then, well, let's, um, let's all of us go around and say the one sentence of introduction that you had suggested cool. earlier, and we can shift to that now. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Hello. 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 <laughs> Hi, Adam. So were you able to hear what Caroline was just saying? Uh, I missed that last part. 
Okay. Um, well, I think we'll summarize it again before we continue on, uh, at least you know, in one line or two. But why don't we just introduce ourselves? Because I was just saying that uh, Caroline, John, TJ, and, my, uh, and myself know each other. Uh, we're meeting you. For, I'm meeting you, and John and TJ are, I assume, for the first time. So, hi. Yeah. Hi. It's great to be here. Thank you for uh, inviting me to this conversation. Uh, do you want to say just a word about yourself in terms of uh, books you may have published recently, or <laughs> uh, other, um, you know, professional? Um, How are you orienting to this conversation? <laughs> like, who are you, Adam? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, I am orienting to this conversation as a student, as a facilitator, as a, a designer, um, as a, uh, um, a permaculturalist, as a, a Denver resident, um, as a Jew, uh, as a male, as a human being. Um, and as an, uh, as Marco mentioned, is an author of a book about uh, social permaculture called "Change Here Now," uh, and I have a copy uh, in my, in my oh, wonderful house. <laughs> I've been jumping around in it and enjoying your writing very much. So I appreciate oh, you here. Great, yeah, I, I'm I'm appreciating being here as well, and, and look forward to uh, to the conversation ahead. Okay. And I, I uh, invited Adam as a special guest speaker um, in part because his book, Change Here Now, um, really explores social permaculture or um, looking uh, uh, at permaculture theory from a kind of a invisible structures of society and of our group, you know, um, interactions uh, and, and looking at it through a pattern, a pattern language, trying to articulate some of the patterns um, that are present in our social dynamics um, and designing with those patterns, which is a really exciting and fabulous thing. Uh, and I just um, uh, invited Adam because I thought that he would have awesome perspective on mm -hmm. collective realization. <laughs> yeah. Um, All right. So why don't we move to John and then TJ and... Uh, I, hmm? I, I'm very interested in, uh, you know, good writing. I'm sort of the night owl. I like to stay up late and be, drink wine. I'm sort of an aging bohemian in the Lower East Side. I think I'm the last one, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want to get morbid, so. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. I'm glad to see you guys. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Hello, everyone. Good evening. I'm TJ. I'm orienting to this conversation as a curious amateur student of human history, um, world making, and I just like to sit and listen to stories. So <laughs> here I am. Um, Caroline, did you already answer that question in your remarks? Or would you like to say something specifically about yourself and how you're orienting if that's what's uh, up? Sure. Well, I um, am the, the author of the essays that um, are the lead off of the Transmuting the Trumpocalypse project. Um, and I am a facilitator and a developer of cooperatives, um, including cosmos.coop, which is um, kind of the platform on which all of these things are happening. Okay. And so I'm Marco Morelli, and I'm co initiator, founder. Uh, participant with uh, Caroline and you know, others in Cosmos, and also a, an editor with the journal Metapsychosis, which is a journal of consciousness, literature, and art, and is hosting this these, this event. And uh, I'm orienting toward this as somebody who loves conversation and loves going places in my mind, uh, but who for whom that you know, talk itself is not enough and who needs and urgently desires to manifest uh, in the world to make things real. Uh, and so the theme of collective realization is kind of what I'm working on uh, in my life. It's a path, it's, it's more than just an idea. And to flesh out what that really means and more than what it means, but to actually do it uh, with others 
since it's collective, is uh, what I hope to accomplish uh, in this life and in general and in this conversation specifically. Uh, so, you know, I, I and we have been organizing these for a couple of years now, actually, on various topics, different authors. And part of what I think we're also cultivating here is what we might call an art, uh, an art of conversation, which involves certain pra like practices. Like we're doing this and some of us have done it many times or we've done it all in many, other, many contexts, but there's something that happens when we bring a, an intentionality or sense of purpose to it and we allow the space itself or allow the conversation itself to, to come alive through us and with us as participants in it and um, instigators or um, shapers or shapeshifters or, or whatever, type, whatever roles we may assume through this process of dialogue. It's fascinating to me how it works and how much it informs um, and inspires, uh, frankly, so many other things in my life, uh, from my family life to my writing to my sense of my, my, my embodiment, my health, my relationships, et cetera, et cetera, and also my political commitments and what I want to stand for, what I want to um, push for uh, or allow for, uh, as the case may be, in the world at large. Um, so this has everything for me to do with realization. And um, I think that, you know, speaking about what collective realization means or doesn't mean, how it relates to maybe individual realization insofar as there may be a polarity there or a, um, a, a complex relationship between individual and other. Uh, and th that's all very interesting to me. And I hope, I, I know we will dive into it and we'll look at it from many different angles. Uh, so, um, the only rules here is just that we respect each other and let each other unfold thoughts. And part of what we're doing is experimental. We don't necessarily all know what's going to happen or what we're going to even think. I mean, if we're successful, we won't know <laughs> and it will be surprising to us. Um, and so to allow that process to happen is the, is the only real um, meta uh, rule. Uh, but as facilitators, moderators, Carolyn and myself can, you know, uh, maybe interject or kind of bring things back if it seems to be going off in some other direction. That's usually a problem when we have more participants. And I think in this group, it will be able to flow pretty easily. So shall we get started? What do you say, Caroline? Yes. Yes, let's. Yes, let's. And actually, a little, I just wanted to add a little thing to what I had said earlier about framing this conversation with collective realization. Um, Implicit in my own thoughts about this and anyone who has read the essays, particularly the essay called Redemption, which actually lays out some suggestions for um, collective shifting of patterns, um, uh, I feel personally strongly um, about that, that each person uh, has, is entitled on some level to participate creatively in their world. Um, and so implied in collective realization, I think, is a kind of participation. If each of us were participating with the fullness of our life power in, in our, at our disposal, um, you know, and we're participating in influencing the myths and stories that we, um, you know, uh, reflected through our actions and in our communities and lives, uh, what, what, would, what would that look like? So uh, what's beyond where we are now uh, in that sense with the myths that we have now. So um, uh, Marco, do you, do you want me to ask the first question that's in our notes or do you want to ask it? <laughs> um, I don't know what is the first question in our notes actually. Oh. <laughs> I, mean, I think we've laid out a bunch of thoughts already. Yeah. And there, there are a bunch of questions implicit, I think in, in those thoughts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, insofar as we're all, sort of coming here from similar yet different places, I'm curious to, like, there, there was a, just an initial reaction to that very idea of collective realization, quote, unquote. Like, uh, I recounted to you before the others got on an email exchange I had about it, uh, where there was some real misunderstanding or sort of projection or other things going on. So I'm curious what that means, what that phrase means to, the, to our guests on the call. 
John? Okay. Um, well, this is a bewildering one for me. Um, because I've had enough experience with all kinds of projects and um, political activism and, and, you know, looking at getting people together and creating some sort of desired outcome rather than focusing on a problem that needs to be solved. I think that's the what I've learned the most over the years, how important desired outcomes are. I think we are obsessed by problems and we tend to, we, we actually create more problems because we stay at the level of the problem. And I think that's the same in solutions, I think, to problems um, are also a trap um, because we tend to want a solution is something that will fit the current prevailing status quo. And I think a desired outcome, what do you want to have happen? actually starts to trigger a futurist, uh, a visionary capacity in a person. Also, it creates a sense of something that's absent, that they don't have, that they would like to have. And I believe once you have a desired outcome, you then can start getting realistic. But you don't want to intrude prematurely into that visionary capacity with uh, real realistic assessments. I noticed working with people who are very sick. I've worked in, uh, in AIDS activism for many years. I was leading self-help support groups for people with AIDS. And I just noticed that the, um, the people who were realistic about their diagnosis or their illness um, didn't do very well compared to those who were unrealistic. And they said, I'm just going to get better. I'm going to get well. Fuck the doctors. I don't give a shit what they say. And I think that attitude, that unrealistic attitude, can be, you know, very healthy, um, especially if you're a, in, a, in a status quo that isn't supporting your, 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 the very best that you can offer. So those are my feelings where I'm at today, because I think we're, uh, uh, it, it takes a certain vigilance. Once you've shaped a desired outcome, it's not easy. I find it, uh, some people need to be supported in that. Um, because very often at a very early age, no one ever asked them what they wanted. So if you ask them what they want to have happen, they're clueless. So I think it takes a certain kind of support so that a person can feel a, a certain amount of comfort in asking for what they want. I know this has been a big challenge for me. But I'm just sharing that with you because as a gay person, I actually, back in the 70s and the, and the 80s and when the AIDS epidemic hit, so many of my, my very close friends were dying, dropping dead within three months of being diagnosed with this strange, mysterious disease. I now look back on that and say most of this was, I, I, I think the word is iatrogenic. In other words, created by the medical profession. I think the experimental drugs, ACT, all these horrible drugs that were given people. Plus the, um, the effects that, uh, you know, if you're a, a a very fragile minority and you're uh, held in contempt by so many others, that has a profound negative effect on, on a person's immune system. I mean, we know mo much more than we ever did about uh, psychoneuroimmunology, how, how the psyche and the, the immune system are connected. Because if someone doesn't like you, it affects your immune system. So anyway, I'm just sharing that because um, I had no idea that I would still be alive. I really didn't think I would make it to my current age. And I look back on all the people who didn't, and it's a great source of frustration for me that, you know, I, I th so many talented people with so much potential and it, and it wasn't fulfilled. So I feel a little bit of a, I have to let go of that so that I can move on and focus on my desired outcomes. Um, so, it's a very individual kind of thing, a desired outcome. Yet to realize the desired outcome that you've expressed and articulated, you need other people to create the conditions for that because you know, no, no person is an island themselves. So I think it's a profound mystery and a great question about what a collective realization could be since, since most of us come from you know, very uneven kind of development. I'm very good at some things and very bad at other things. And I, I do need uh, feedback from others. And it's, um, 
sometimes very challenging because you don't you need to ask the right people who have a certain amount of competence to give you the feedback that's useful and not everyone can give good feedback it's actually quite an art and i'm very impressed by everyone's skill in that area um, here and so i think i've said enough thank you very much <laughs> Adam, you've unmuted yourself, I see. Yeah. Um, well, first, I just, I just wanted to, to thank John for his uh, for sharing his thoughts and his story. Um, I mean, I think it's amazing to it, it gives so much ret richness and depth to the faces on these screens um, to, to start to understand where we're each coming from and, and the, the themes that have animated our lives. Um, when I think about the phrase uh, collective realization, um, I'm first drawn to the, the biological concept of uh, emergence, um, which is the term used to describe how uh, multiple individuals uh, or multiple cells within an individual can display properties um, that can't be described by their agglomeration alone. Um, so it's, you know, kind of this collective intelligence and, and I think, you know, humans as a social species, uh, certainly display that emergence, but I think sometimes we let our own individual brains get in the way of understanding our role as part of these, uh, larger, uh, super organisms. Um, and, and kind of like John was, was talking about this kind of fixation on problems and solutions which belies this kind of, you know, Cartesian logical way of going about things. You know, our, our brains tend to project ideas of the way the world is or the way we think it ought to be and then envision solutions to that and, and say, what can we do uh, using our brains to achieve those solutions and to convince other people to go along with our solutions as opposed to those other people's solutions. Um, and yet there's this quality of emergence that, that is always there. And sometimes it's more subtle and sometimes it's right in your face that goes, uh, much beyond what any individual's mind, um, can conceive. And, and I've found that when I'm in a group that displays, uh, and, and has created, uh, the culture of, of trust and creativity and that's able to nurture one another and where everyone's kind of basic needs are being met and, and where, you know, maybe people in the community are actually meeting each other's basic needs and that that group displays an intelligence that can't be uh, described or, or proscribed by just the, the individual intelligence of the people's brains in the group. Um, and it's, it's kind of allowing that emergent, intelligence of a community to flow um and and so rather than uh kind of identifying problems and designing solutions to those problems i feel like the the key in my experience to this kind of collective manifestation is to rather just try to create the conditions whereby that group intelligence can identify and solve problems without necessarily even doing it with words but just doing it organically, letting that group intelligence play itself out. I'd love to respond to that. Um, I have been a cooperative business developer for years, and I got into that work through uh, a result of my experience with um, a worker cooperative kind of a setup uh, in a in a bicycle collective I was involved in and my experience was so empowering and fulfilling in ways that I had no hopes of jobs ever being um, frankly that I became really passionate about it and wanted to spread it and I can totally echo and endorse what uh, you just said Adam that there is a emergent collective intelligence when uh, individual beings can show up uh, that is beyond the, the sum of its parts. Um, and uh, I really believe in that. Uh, and I believe that in a sense, we're missing that on more of a collective and societal level. Um, 
particularly as we <laughs> are moving more and more into a corporatocratic type state where uh, the sense is that we need to manage democratic populations, which uh, as opposed to letting the democrat democratic process actually co-constitute um, what the structures are, um, the sense of management is, I think, very cynical and, um, and self-limiting because we're in, a, in essence saying that we don't think some people's contributions are worthy and we don't think that actually allowing them to participate has meta value <laughs> beyond uh, beyond that. And I, I think it really does, though. Um, I think that worker co-ops um, oftentimes make better decisions and uh, are more functional because each of the stakeholders and each of the sensors, each of the sentient beings involved in the system are contributing to the decisions um, versus more hierarchical organizations. Um, so, yeah, there's something missing when we don't invite and allow uh, all of the sentient beings in a system to really contribute um, to meaning making uh, in that system. So I think we're really missing something on a societal level when we uh, disallow participation um, and dialogue at that at that level. I can say a few words here then. And I'll also bring in a question that, like a framing device even, uh, that we should note. This, this being November the 9th, 2017, so the one year anniversary of the election. So there's a, where we could read a, a certain significance in, into the day. And you wrote some notes here, uh, Caroline. Um, there's a, there's a sense that perhaps something has shifted in our collective mythos or collective consciousness, in the discourse, in the society, uh, and a question of what that might be, uh, and where that where the openings might be, where the potentials there might be. A, a part of I think that what we need to talk about, if we're talking about collective realization, whether it's at the scale of a worker co-op or of a nation state is how that actually functions. And we have a system for that, right, that we refer to as democracy. We have a constitution, we have legal structures, we have ways that force power is distributed, how rights are all allocated, and a whole insane, you know, immense complex uh, bureaucracy that is itself in response to other bureaucracies, other huge systems. I mean, and the whole, the thing as a whole, Adam mentioned the superorganism earlier. It's some kind of, I mean, when I think of it mythologically, I don't, I don't see a, a, an organism or a, or a Gaian, a Gaian, a Gaian um, uh, you know, benevolent being. It's something more like, like, a, like a monster. <laughs> it's something more like Cthulhu or some multi-tentacular type of being that's kind of, it's beyond, it would seem, could seem beyond our control. Uh, a life of its own, and we are really reacting uh, to what it's doing. That's how. That's one way of seeing it, and part of I think what might we might be dealing with is the level of metaphor, the level of myth, the level of. Uh, I mean, when we even talk about Trump, he's not a he's not a person to us in general. I mean, he's this media monster like he's a monster created by media created by our minds and yet he has real power real in the sense that according to the u.s military chain of command he could initiate uh nuclear strike i mean actions that could really you know wipe out human life on earth uh but that's a, you know that's a worst case scenario uh so Part of one of the things I've been thinking about collective realization is that, and this is some feedback I've got, I got about the term, is that, is that it? Is that enough? Can, what happens if we have collective realization in a meeting? What happens next? What's a desired outcome, perhaps, as a way to bring in? And then, and then 
how do you get so many desired outcomes in some kind of coherence toward these large to to, um, to manifest uh, some more beneficial state of affairs than uh, living in the belly of a beast? Uh, yeah, so. I'll, I'll leave it there. I think those are somewhat elliptical, perhaps ambiguous questions. I don't know how, how well they concretize, but this notion of, I'll, I'll say one thing about democracy, and that's that something that we may forget about or may be forgotten in the discourse is that democracy requires a certain kind of people, a certain kind of individual, a certain practice, certain habits. We have to do things to maintain what a democracy is, and we evidently haven't been doing them well. <laughs> so one of the inspirations for me to start a co-op, I'd never, I'd been a member of a food co-op before. I'd never really been a, even conceived of being able to participate in an organization democratically. But one of the motivations is that, geez, we have to learn how to do democ democracy and we're not gonna learn it just by voting for one or another candidate. Even, even at the local level, just voting is not enough. Like, there has to be a practice. It has to be a way of life. And um, there's an idea I'll, I'll add to the mix. One more meme. <laughs> uh, it's, um, it was coined by John Dewey. He wrote a paper about this, I think, in 1938. And the paper was called Creative Democracy. And, and that notion, uh, which he articulates beautifully there and I think could be updated, uh, that democracy itself can be a creative act and that there could be a synthesis of democratic practice and creative practice. And we might, and we could actually do that at least on some scales, perhaps on a meta scale, but certainly at the sort of fractal micro scale, that's very, I think, promising. Uh, so John, uh, I know John, you wanted to comment. I kind of went on a little bit further, but well, I, welcome. I, I, is TJ, TJ, did you want to speak? I wanted everyone to get a chance to chime in before I interact with you. So. Oh, no, you, you can go. I was, I, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 you go I first. have a thought. Because <laughs> my, my thought is, is more of a question. I mean, and it's, I guess, to the, to the whole panel here. It, we're talking really about breaking into a virtuous cycle of motivated individuals and a collective, uh, I'm going to Jungian terms, collective unconscious, or a collective realization of um, what what the most beneficial to the group would be. And it's you need the individuals, and then you need the individuals operating in the group to kind of reinforce that. And it's kind of it, it's like you know you've heard of vicious cycles. This would be kind of be a, a virtuous cycle. I think I've lost everybody. It's frozen. No, you're good. You're good. Okay. <laughs> My computer's wonky. So, but I mean, that's so the question. So, I mean, breaking into that from where we are seems to be the step to take. But how do you how do you do that? Where who starts first, or does it is it have to be a collection of? Hmm. That's a good question. I have a comment um, that's quick. Um, I think uh, if if there's uh, if we are just shaped by our conditioning, and then our actions are automatic in the world, uh, and so we're reinforcing what we've been conditioned to, then it is hopeless. There's no breaking out of our situation. But if there's at all any room, any space between the stories we b believe in and the axis of our action in the world, that, that brink of the, the moment in which we act, then there's room to potentially move around and explore other things in that space, other ways of looking at the same information or other framings for it. And that's where uh, I think, so for in, in the essays that I wrote, I really uh, advocate for creating that space through certain practices and then uh, the creative democracy aspect that Marco mentioned becomes more possible because you have room to, to move. And so 
uh, creating this, the space between um, thought form and conditioning and, and, and action and actually being able to look internally and, and some raise self-awareness also collectively about patterns that are expressing themselves in our psychologies, but also in a group, you know, a group mind, um, then that uh, can enable freedom to move amongst them and to maybe change direction a bit. So that's where I see the potential for um, breaking out of this this situation we seem locked into, and this this appearance of these kind of metaphenomenon as the monster, like Marco said, it seems beyond us, um, but maybe we actually have more agency there than we think we do. That's all. Thank you. So we we model it. We don't necessarily wait for the larger society. And I think I brought this up in the, the thread we were talking about today, John. Yeah. John. Yeah, I um, it. You know, it's really kind of seizing the bull by the horns and, and say, and, and not, not bull is a horrible, <laughs> not charging ahead like a bull in the China shop, but just kind of, you know, Hey, this works. The water's fine. Um, I've been able to step out of the things that even I've learned or been conditioned with, but Hey, I, I heard this other story over here and it, it made some sense. And, you know, it, it, I hadn't heard that before, but I kind of incorporated that into my world and just put, put that space in there. Well, you know, stories are very tricky and um, we all have our favorites and um, some of the stories I, I've just noticed as I get older, I have um, memories that I'll share with friends and we'll be around, sitting around talking. This happens rarely actually these days, but, um, and they'll say, oh no, it didn't happen like that. It happened like this. And I'll go, oh, did it? Oh, all right. And then I'll go with the flow a little bit. And I say, no, 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 it happened this way. So I believe that memory actually is distributed among groups of people. And we're gonna remember different things. And as we get older, we're going to remember, what we're going to remember is what is important to us now. And some things will drop out. It's amazing how much amnesia I have for things that, because I've kept a journal since I was like a teenager and I very rarely read it. But when I do, I'm astonished because I'm talking about people who have no idea who they are. <laughs> I don't remember them at all. I had a, I had a girlfriend, a very close friend of mine, I live in California. And I, I was reading a journal about this guy named Alan. And I was really in this hot romance with him. And I was like, who was this guy? So I called a friend of mine in California and I said, remember when I was, when you were in New York and I was this guy named Alan, we started talking about it and she said, oh yeah, he was a member of the theater company you were in, remember? And I went, oh yeah, Alan, now it's all flooding back into my, my memory. And I think that's sort of the way life is. It's because he was a very important person for a very brief amount of time. And then I moved on and totally forgot about him. And that's probably healthy. And I think, I, I think this has been a report that some people have been making about our current situation with this technology and social media and, and people hooking up after having not been in each other's orbit for a long time. And maybe that's not such a good idea to be able to go to Facebook and find someone you, you knew in high school. Um, I mean, it might be a nice thing. Maybe is, there are still connections there. But I think life sometimes is a lot about um, People come into your life and it serves a purpose for both of you. And then it, then you both move on. Uh, I've gotten, and I'm not, it, is, it isn't always easy to let go of people you're attached to, but I, I think that's going to become a life skill for a lot of people living in the kind of turbulent times we're living in and people don't stay in the same place as they used to. Except for me, I've stayed here for a very long time. So I'm just sharing that with you guys because I've, I, I really do feel like our memory with, with the technology and how it's, we're interacting with this, I mean, it fries my brains just about every day I get an overload. And um, I'm sure that young nervous systems being exposed to this, uh, they're going to be very different uh, as, they, as they age and mature, being exposed to all of this. So I think it's wonderful and I love some of it, but I think there's a shadow side and a dark side, which, which we've discussed. And um, I think now it's really um, intruded upon our politics in a very dramatic way. 
So anyway, that's my two cents. Adam, do you have anything to share on these uh, things? Sure, yeah, I have, I have lots of things to share. Um, <laughs> you know, one thing that occurs to me is, um, you know, Mar Marco's uh, kind of talk of self or collective realization and, um, and, and the fact of Trump as this kind of, uh, you know, myth that's that's larger than life and is is a real person but is also this just kind of manifestation of a story i mean that's that's a perfect example of collective realization um and it's you know maybe collective realization of a system that is uh that is unhealthy um and that is aimed towards things that that the people in this conversation might not agree with but um, I think it's so true that like this culture has created Donald Trump and not Donald Trump as like the human being as the individual, but Donald Trump as the meme. Um, and, and in some ways, um, I think it's, it's a natural end point or maybe not even end point, but a natural next step in, in so many different trends, uh, some of which John was talking about in terms of digitization and, and information overload. Um, and, uh, you know, to me, I, what, my, my kind of systems lens sees uh, our current moment as one of, um, uh, it, in what ecological terms is called disturbance. Um, so it's, it's, you know, in ecosystems, you have systems that evolve and get more and more complex and large and sophisticated and diverse um, until something happens, until some big event comes along and shakes them all up. Um, and that event could be, you know, a forest fire or a drought or a flood or, um, or people coming and chainsawing it. Um, and then that act of disturbance kind of shifts the state from one stable uh, position into into a into a time of chaos and then eventually out of that chaos the maybe that same cycle starts again or maybe it's tipped into a different state of of stability um and a whole new set of uh species can can emerge and and i think we're right on the precipice of one of those moments of chaos that that we've had a system that's been more or less stable for the last I don't know, a few centuries um, with, with certain, certainly some important blips along the way. Um, but that, that, that system that's really been in place um, since the beginning of the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, is, is kind of coming apart at the seams. And, and so the collective realization of these, um, of, of these monsters like Donald Trump and and this also the what we see is this blurring between truth and and fiction and um this kind of hyper connectedness that fries our brains all of these i think are symptoms of the state of uh of collapsing systems that we've created from from the kind of logical endpoint of this story that we've been telling for the last few hundred years um and so i say all that to offer actually some hope that, you know, after the forest fire comes new growth and the forest fire has to take its course. And, um, and, and I think that fire fortunately or unfortunately is, is kind of just getting underway. Um, but, uh, but that in the wake of that, I actually see so many possibilities for new stories that, that I see so many people around me starting to tell. Uh, one other thing I wanted to talk about was um, was scale. Um, I think a lot of what doesn't work about democracy, a lot of what doesn't work about social media, um, and and so many other things that haven't been brought into this conversation, is that they've become too large for us to understand or work with in any meaningful way. Um, and, and part of the story that's now become dysfunctional that we've been telling for so long is, is this idea that bigger is better, that more efficient is better, 
that uh, that in order for something to be a valid uh, idea or meme or solution, it has to quote unquote scale um, to reach a certain threshold of impact. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I think until we create stories that work on a human scale and, and literal structures that work on a human scale, um, we'll keep finding ourselves butting our heads up against, um, these, these confusing challenges because we're, we're trying to solve, you know, democracy. I think there's many things about our democratic system that don't work. But one of them is I just don't think it's realistic to expect a community of 300 million to work in a democratic way. I don't even know if it's realistic to expect a community of 300,000 to work in a democratic way um, because of the, just the, the dynamics of uh, the number of faces our brains can recognize and the number of relationships we can hold in our brains at any given time. And, and the amount of, time we have to to get to know people um and things like that um so i think democracy is brilliant in theory and and is a is a powerful tool for collective realization but we have to recognize its its limits to scale um and and a practice appropriate scale first uh, so how, how might that relate if i'm to throw out a question to Caroline's point earlier about the management of societies. Because if you can't scale democracy to the level of the nation state effectively or, you know, reasonably, uh, then, and, but you still have a nation state level and in fact, global level, global scale society, uh, then there are all kinds of things that have to happen for that to, to be the case. Regulations on commerce, on trade, on aggression, et cetera. I mean, everything that has evolved has evolved in a certain way for a purpose. Uh, but what is the future? I'm to ask a way too big question, but what's the future of democracy if, 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 it, if it can't work, if we can't have it uh, at that scale? If, because if that scale is not being managed democratically, then how is it being managed? And how does that relate to our micro scale democratic initiatives? Uh, I have a thought I'll, on that. Go ahead, TJ or Adam, or I'm sorry, Adam. <laughs> multiple people want to talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we're talking about scale and democracy and why oligarchy always <laughs> takes over democracy and destroys it from within and why the nation state is, you know, all, all that great stuff. Um, the larger the scale, the greater the empire. Go ahead, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, what, one kind of organizing principle that I'd like to just kind of throw in there, um, not, not to necessarily answer your question, Marco, but, but to maybe help uh, clarify it or focus it, um, is, is one of, you know, something I talk about in my book, which is this principle of subsidiarity, um, which is that problems should be solved at the most local level practical. Um, so that, that communities who are most directly impacted by a decision should be the ones uh, in charge of, of making that decision. Um, so, you know, along those lines, many day-to-day -day things about how our communities are governed or function or run might be made at this very more local scale. But then there are certain things uh, that still could end up being made at a, at more of a hierarchical, uh, regional, national, global scale, um, and I think part of the part of the challenge we find ourselves in today is that we're so overconnected as as a global society that we rely on people uh, in these far flung corners of the globe, such that everyone is is really impacted by everyone else. Um, so, like my my choices as a, as a consumer affect the lives of families in Vietnam um, because they're dependent on my consumer choices, just for a, one of many examples. Um, and so if, if we follow subsidiarity to its, to its conclusion, you know, by, by relocalizing the way our needs are met, um, we, we relocalize the sphere at which decisions have to be made. Um, 
And again, there's always going to be some decisions that have to be made at greater scales. Um, but, but by simplifying that kind of sphere of influence, um, we're able to, to feel less overwhelmed by the complexity of, of how our, uh, our decisions affect others. Well, I think you, you raised some very interesting questions. Um, I'm thinking about, I think it was Anthony Giddens, some sociologist I read back in the 90s, who, who said that the nation state is too large for, to solve local problems, and the nation state is too small to solve global problems. So um, it looks like this was 20 years ago he said that, and it, it appears a lot of people that, you know, it's all run amok. Um, I don't know that all complex, unstable systems are pathological, though. Um, just like you mentioned a, a forest fire, there are benefits that for the forest, for those fires. So, and I think the same is true for di disease processes. And, um, you know, they may be inconvenient or unpleasant, but there's sometimes, you know, a cold or some sort of illness comes along and detoxifies your body and makes you rest. So these can have benefits. But I think it's, it's hard to tell if it's chaos or complexity um, or something in between. I, I, think we, I think if you treat a system as if it is simpler than it is, as I think Trump is doing, then you will drive a system that's complex into chaos through an oversimplification. Um, and I think that's probably what's happening. But I think chaos is very rare, actually. And chaos tends not to last very long. Some sort of order emerges. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I avoid chaos as much as possible. Um, and I think we should. But if we are in a chaotic system, there's really no rules that you can follow. There are no procedures. You just have to embrace the death space and hope you get um, you know, through it and to the other side. I don't think we're there yet. Um, maybe, maybe we are. We'll, we'll find out. But once again, I think, uh, you know, complex and stable systems are sometimes not, are very creative. So, um, yeah. But I do think our foundations of our, our, our political system is really based on procedures and uh, the executive branch, the legislative branch, the rules and the regulations. And probably that's why the American Revolution was successful in the way that the French were not. Um, this is speculation on my part. This is what I've heard from people who've studied this stuff, which I haven't. But it, it seems to be that that procedural method had some temporary benefits for our country. And um, I think the Supreme Court has been, a, it's really worked, except I think the two party system has frozen. And I think the two party system is going extinct. But I wonder if there's other ways of doing democracy besides two rigidly controlled um, parties. I think that's where we're getting locked into this Newtonian uh, Euclidean grid, which our forefathers, of course, that was the worldview that they held. We talked about this last time, and we're moving into more Einsteinian relativity, quantum physics. Um, a different kind of politics must emerge because we're much more complex than you know that basically agrarian society that our that our founding fathers were trying to to organize, and it was a slave society also. So, I would. I would. I would love to jump in if I may. <laughs> um, uh, and then TJ, I know you, I can see that you want to talk too. Um, but I, I have several thoughts. Um, so I, I think that um, what can feel like chaos, as we've been talking about, can be actually a, a, a threshold beyond which we cannot see, but that leads to a different configuration of order, a higher order. And I do see the potential with the complexity that we have as a, 
as a collective consciousness and as a collective um, mutually interdependent global society um, to to uh, actually just reorder ourselves in, in an even more elegant way. And what I, what I see that looking like goes to what we've been talking about. So I think it's so interesting that you raise about, John, about how democracy in this country is treated very procedurally. And we have an intensive faith and devotion and reverence for this proce these procedures that we follow. But it's kind of interesting how at the at the you know institutional gross scale we say we are a democracy and these these are the rules that we follow that make us a democracy but we don't actually practice all of the underpinning underlying uh ways that would feed into a healthy democracy democracy at that scale is kind of aspirational it's saying this is who we want to be as a people we want to be democratic because we want to believe that everybody's created equal and that we all ha deserve to participate in our political institutions. But we don't actually support those outcomes uh, at, at all on a, in terms of cultural uh, or, you know, practice interpersonal practices. Right. So the way I see it, uh, a feasible and, and, and enduring democracy be attainable is almost like a spiral where at the you know you might have the individual scale the in the smallest scale in the cycle um, or in the system and uh from the individual practices to the interpersonal practices to some of the more group practices to social practices to the kind of local problem solving as adam talked about and then in terms of our interconnections that scaling up from a practice and pattern level to the level of then the institutional to the way the institutional systems express themselves um, because we're expressing ourselves in certain along certain lines throughout the system. So that's how I see um, the potential for, you know, actually attaining a more complex order. Um, that's also an elegant order is, is along the lines of the practices or patterns actually being reflected at all scales kind of uh, refractily almost. Um, and I want to also call attention to something I find really fascinating about this moment in history, which is that we have extreme and gross economic stratification and social stratification in terms of what, you know, privileges are afforded different people of different statuses. And uh, that kind of hierarchical, you know, social organization, um, castes and, you know, stratus stratification is, is pretty widespread in human society. Um, and it's it really exacerbated now in this country, particularly when it comes to uh, wealth disparity. But I think it's interesting to remember that we actually are interconnected with one another as human beings socially with only six degrees of separation, they say, <laughs> you know, um, meaning I'm only six people away from anyone else on Earth, again, in theory. But if you look at the reality of how um, institutions express themselves, how corporate decisions are made, how government laws are made, you know, it's actually people undertaking processes that are social at their nature, communication, you know, writing, legislation, whatever. It's, it's actually all happening interpersonally. It's all happening between us. And that, but, but what the social kind of strata is more of a um, mycelial fungal uh, network type of a, of a reality that we live in. And, and actually these hierarchical, these seemingly hierarchical forms are, are expressing themselves through a medium that is itself networked. <laughs> so uh, I, I think that actually has a lot of potential as a, as a pivot point. Uh, if we kind of focus on the, you know, the, the internet is an example of, of the, the inter-networking, the, the inter-social connections, how I'm now having, for instance, social relationships with you, TJ, and with you, John, be, even though you're far away because of the internet, it's an example of how that works. And if we could kind of amplify or focus or kind of, um, I don't know, explore that more, uh, that would be, that would be a, an exciting. That's a very big challenge. Mm -hmm. I think I've mentioned this before about the how momentum happens when you're in face-to-face -face relationships with people you you go to the bar you hang out at the you know 
you're at the cafe and you make an agreement to go to this march or that demonstration, these public events, um, lots of bodies together making sounds and entering into a rhythm together. It's very galvanizing. And you go from one event to another event to another event and it creates momentum and the, the events get larger and larger and larger. I mean, I saw this happen. And the gay rights movement began in Manhattan, Stonewall. I wasn't here for that, but a few years later, I was here. And it was about, oh, maybe a thousand guys. We were, we, we, I joined the march. We went up to, you know, uh, I think it was Central Park from Washington Square. And then the next year, there was a few thousand. The next year, there was many more thousands. And then the next year, there were half a million people. And then we went to Washington. There was a million people. In, in 91, when we went to Washington, that very big pivotal moment in, in gay history. And you could feel something had shifted. But I don't know about now. I know people are still marching and demonstrating. Um, and I know that the internet serves a lot of those the, the connections that are made. Um, but I'm just worried that, you know, without the, that face-to-face -face in real time, that we're not going to be able to entrain, get into each other's rhythms. It's very personal and intimate. And that I think is, has been what when uh, movements have been successful, that's because of those kinds of uh, intimate kind of exchanges. So I'm wondering if we can make something like that happen here. Uh, I think we're doing a lot of really good, good work. I think we've planted a lot of seeds and we're all writing and reading each other's writing and you know, study groups. I'm a great believer in the study group. I think this is a very important trend and I hope we keep this going because I think that's where a lot of the momentum starts to be generated in these study groups. So that's a great question. TJ, you wanna pick it up? Um, yeah, I was going to, I was actually going to piggyback on the, uh, comparisons between the American and French revolutions, but we don't have to go, I knew you would know something there. about that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we ended up with the two party system that our founding fathers didn't want. And France ended up with a kind of parliamentary system. That's a little more complex than the two party system that we do have. So that's kind of a thought they kind of let a chaos, you know, kind of fester into something that actually ended up being beneficial. Um, but to, to John's point just now, I mean, I think the, we can model on this scale in this group too, and whatever, we can model a better internet, basically. I mean, and that's what I guess we're trying to do here. I mean, I've come from other groups and it's call them discussion groups is kind of being generous. It just always degenerates into these, you know, artillery shell peeing contests and, you know, lobbying, <laughs> insults at each other and no real no real discourse no real dialogue and I, it's all good to have people who have different opinions but if you can't sit down and, and put some parameters around that so that everybody's contributing and you're getting somewhere or even if, even to the point of agreeing to disagree and i think that just kind of opening up the space and, and putting discussion there is is a good thing and that gives us um we can spread ideas faster in this time than, than possibly in other times too. So the, the catching on of that. And then that touches on Carolyn's point that from there you can, you can kind of build it out, you know, but you have to model it first. And I think the small groups have to kind of model it first. Right. Uh, there's a, um, a futurist. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of John Takara um, but he, uh, in a book he wrote, gosh, maybe 10 years ago now called in the bubble, um, spoke about how the, the internet works really well as the scaffolding for healthy community. Um, but we should never mistake it for the bricks. Um, and, and that's always stuck with me because I think, you know, like, like you're saying, TJ, I think we can exchange ideas online. We can seed uh seed projects uh through this flow of of information that that the internet facilitates but i think what the internet has done among many other things is uh allowed us to privilege ideas over action um and to just really just kind of get lost in in connection and just the the excitement of connection 
um, and forget that that at the end of the day we still have to, as John was saying, you know, get together in the flesh in large numbers to create really, the change that we, we need to have see. To change the law, <laughs> <laughs> just feeling right. good together right. is not enough. You've got to change the laws. That's right. not easy to do, but it can be done. It has mm-hmm. been done. They, we struck down the sodomy laws. We got the Marriage Act. You know, all of that happened. But mm-hmm. I also saw a lot of those breakthroughs happen right after a really good gay film like uh, Brokeback Mountain came out. The sodomy laws were struck down six months later. Many people, and it was in the Midwest, huge audiences saw that movie, mostly women. Heterosexual women loved it. And then you saw the sodomy laws evaporate. And we've been fighting hard to get rid of that for so long. So. And now I think the, the more, more recent movie um, about the, the young man in Florida, I can't, it won an Oscar last, last, uh, last year. One of my favorite. Moonlight. Moonlight. Just an amazing film. So I think that, that generates all kinds of rippling effects that affects our politics. So anyway, I'm just very hopeful about that, how important art is for culture and for new ideas and and it shifts our politics. But I also think it shapes our science. I think we need art to move our scientific agendas forward as well, because most people are not gonna understand the science unless there's a, a good science fiction movie or there's some bio on a famous uh, scientist who created this. We need those, we need that fiction, we need that story, um, the backstory to a lot of this science to make sense of it. And uh, anyway, those are things we can work on here too, because many of us are writing about this stuff. And you and I like to use fiction myself, but um, I think we can. There are all kinds of hybrids that are we can explore now in writing. Uh, I'll throw in a thought here. And that's that. You know, as much as as important as the critique of technology is. And I think it's not something we can let go or um, let be. And I think it's important to, to undertake that critique, the question concerning technology, uh, and to, to look at where it's coming from. Where does that impulse to, as Heidegger put it, and frame the world to extract from the world? Insofar as that's what technology, what, that's an expression of it. He said, called it an essential expression, or he might he might look at it in those ways. But I I want to take an I want to propose an alternate view that we need to hold simultaneously. I think, uh, and that's that we need it. We, we, if we're talking about the question of scale, and we can't do democracy at the planetary scale, then the only way for that to work is through some technological mediation. And we know that AI is coming; it's already here. Uh, it's progressing much faster even than a couple of years ago, I thought it would. And part of what is happening is that the, you know, big, it's, it's become a, a kind of weapon. Like AI is kind of a weapon. It's both weaponized by governments. We know the US, China, Iran, all AI, China, AI programs, that's, the, that's like the next nuclear, you know, that, that's the next Manhattan Project in a certain way is to d- develop a um, general intelligence AI or what have you. Um, but what is good about like, embracing the technology is that like, I don't have access to real weaponry. I don't, have a- I don't have, I have an army at my disposal. I don't have a billion dollars invested. But for a few bucks a month, I can host a website. I can pay for a video conference service and I could talk to all of you. And if we, if that, if we have that scaffolding to uh, initiate, propagate, uh, and scale conversations or memes, practices, habits, and then we turn that into collective realization in the sense of in the flesh action. Uh, and by that, I, I'm thinking. I don't know exactly what I'm thinking. I mean, there's a lot already happening. Adam, you're familiar. You read a lot about this in, in, in your book, uh, all the different kind of seedlings and sprouts, uh, and sometimes more than that, sometimes more, more well-developed uh, examples. For example, in 
Spain, the Mondragon Cooperative is a billion dollar company or more. Yes. And so it can be done. There are models and we're not starting from scratch. We have uh, exemplars. Uh, we have the internet, we have YouTube, <laughs> we, we have, um, and we even have increasingly, we'll have access to AI. AI, as uh, Kevin Kelly says, uh, he, he says it's going to be like a utility, like the electricity. So we'll have our kind of personal AI and we can, um, it'll be a consumer product essentially. Um, so if that's the case, if we have those tools at our disposal, what do we do with them? Because this is a tremendous opportunity that we have. And if this truly is a kind of phase shift moment and we're going to go into a chaotic period, but there is the potential to reorganize, recrystallize at a higher level of, of, of functioning and all of the downscale effects that would have on our individual lives and livelihoods and, and happiness, uh, then it seems that, and I think this is part of why we poured so much work, Caroline, into you know, producing the, those, the essays and trying to, you know, get people to talk. Um, we have a golden opportunity, it seems. And I don't want to be naive. Uh, we've just published a piece by a fellow named Alexander Blum uh, called The Case Against Liberation, uh, Mystic Pessimism. He makes an interesting argument that I would encourage folks to, to check out because, you know, he sees that the rule of capital, uh, which, you know, is in distinguishable from, I think at this point, the rule of, tech, you know, the, the technological world that we're uh, enmeshed in um, is uh, formidable. It's more formidable perhaps than, than many of us would want to admit. Yes. And, and so it, it's an uphill, it's an upstream, <laughs> it's an upstream uh, uh, swim uh, to, to, to do this. And, and the collective part is really important. I mean, how could we do this alone? really. You know, we have to find others. We have to find others who align and everyone has to find others, not just the people in this group. I mean, I, I want part of the reason we're recording this, putting it out is so that others can do the same thing. And we're doing, you know, I'm learning from, I'm not just making this up. I'm taking from all of you and from things I read and things I see and recombining it and saying, why don't we do this? Why don't we talk about this? And uh, that process I find is exhilarating actually uh, because as you, as, as we sort of surrender kind of to the chaos and surrender to the moment that we're living in uh, creative energies arise and you certainly find yourself doing things that you, that surprise you. You didn't know you would, could do that or would do that. And now you are. And maybe that's kind of what you're saying too, John, about how things can grow. Uh, and, May not, we may not reach utopia per se, but we can improve, yes. So I want to, I, I just want to call attention to our time. Um, we wanted to end at 7.30, um, which is four, four minutes from now. So maybe we could close the talk tonight with kind of a response to the questions that you raised just now, Marco, um, around around AI um, or, you know, how, what is, what is the we in collective realization? Like, you know, what are the ways that we can, uh, can shift uh, together? If that works for folks, I, I do have, uh, I'll give my response and then um, that'll be the last thing that I, that I say tonight. Um, I, I think that there's a big issue with the conflation of our economic motivations and our technological design. Um, because, uh, and I just read an article um, called There's Something Wrong with the Internet. It's on Medium. Uh, definitely look it up. Uh, it's uh, kind of about the proliferation of bots and how bots uh, make these YouTube videos. Uh, it kind of just automatically generate these YouTube videos for the sake of advertising revenue and things like that. And they're targeted for children. Um, and it's it's kind of weird and upsetting. <laughs> but, um, right, we, we have designed our technologies to reflect our currently our collective aspirations, which amount to ca global capitalism, right? And global capitalism is an, a capitalism is itself uh, an enduringly exploitative framing. So it's about how much can you extract from one another? And that's extremely problematic <laughs> um, to have AI and have these kind of autonomous technologies whose motives are tied with that, that becomes very dangerous quickly. Um, and when I think about Terminator type futures, 
that's what it's tied to. It it's tied to how we program our AI, which which is going to be a reflection of how we're programmed, right? Uh, and and the motives that we have for things, right? So, I'm really interested actually in the potential for compassionate AI, AI that has a deep sense of our human condition and has compassion for it. Maybe the AI is in fact smarter than us, but it cares that we are struggling and that we are have these messy emotions and these messy labels that we put on things and that we're constantly bewildered. It has compassion for that, you know? And um, it wants to work with us to realize our aspirations in a mutually beneficial, reinforcing way. Um, so similar to kind of to how there, I think, are some memes that are more mu- mutually beneficial and mutually survival oriented, <laughs> as opposed to the memes that could kill us and kill them with it, ironically, um, more like a parasite. Um, I think that there's also the potential that we, re- we refine our relationship to technology um, as one that, you know, even if it's an artificial intelligence, do we relate to other intelligent beings biological or artificial with respect and with compassion and with an attempt for mutual sense making of this situation that we're in. So those are my thoughts on that. Well, that's a very big topic. Um, I know, I think it was Alvin Noe, the philosopher who said, there isn't any such thing as artificial intelligence. This is pseudo intelligence. And it comes out of a very deficient mental worldview. And I, I think it's all bullshit. Machines are never going to be smart enough. And I've had a few, not a lot, but enough anomalous experiences that don't fit the current paradigm to know that I and all of you are more, much more. And we can even, we just have a little bitty glimpse of it once in a while, of what our potential is. And, uh, this AI stuff is just doomed, I think. It's the left brain run amok, disconnected from the rest of the organism and the environment. And I think there's some hope with some of the more advanced AI that's coming out that really interests me. Because if you want to create a machine that's going to act like a human, you have to create an environment for that machine. And I think that's when you get to a much more sophisticated level. And then I think you can have some modeling programs that could be of great use for human beings to interact at that level. But to this whole singularity crap, I can't believe people are, are, are giving them their power away to this shit. I'm sorry, I've had a few much wine tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but really, I think the singularity is over. It's already happened. Nothing has changed at all. And nothing is changing in this current political environment we're in. It's just yo-yo back and forth from Republican to Democrat to Democrat to Republican. So I don't think uh, any of this AI stuff is going to have any use at all. That's my two cents. I'll Thank have you what he's having. <laughs> <laughs> I'm open-minded, though. If someone else has a different perspective on this, I appreciate that. I have uh, let's hear from TJ and Adam and then uh, some closing remarks and, and we'll call it a night. I, I'm, I'm, I have a pumpkin pie in the house and, and a, an IPA that I'm going to enjoy uh, <laughs> with or without AI. Hastening off the dessert. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> well, I just, I was typing it in. I didn't know what I was going to say. It, it, who, who gets to, program it who gets to be the primary and most influential committee or person or deciding where where ai is going to go that's kind of the thought that i that i'd leave for that yeah if we're going to expand the scale and and give us a democracy that's going to touch people but still kind of take the local flavor and make that a, a basis of it we are going to need technology to help I mean, we we need a technology to get to the nation state that we have today anyway so with that i don't see that process not continuing um it's just gonna it's gonna boil down more i mean i hear where john is what john is saying it's gonna boil down to more who has the control over that as to how beneficial or detrimental it's going to be okay I don't have uh, too much 
uh, else to add, um, I, I love the diversity of uh, perspectives on, on AI that, that's been shared. Um, I guess where I stand is I, I think uh, it will, I'm guessing it's going to have a lot of uh, fruitful potential in the future as well as um, destructive potential. And, and it's, you know, also not going to be that the, the, the end all of our world or the solution to, to the problems we face, just like the internet is neither the, the solution to everything as we've been talking about, nor is it the source of all our problems. It's more of just one, one more representation of our attempts at making a better world and our, our more base attempts to control one another. Um, and AI is just going to be another chapter in, in that saga. But, but, uh, you know, if if we're looking for what what can save us, um, I think maybe as John was was intimating a little bit, it's it's not about something that doesn't exist yet. It's about something that's always existed. Hmm. That's good. I think that might be a good place to close our conversation. Um, I thought I had something to add, but. I don't think I will. I'm writing a book, by the way. It's called I Am the Singularity. Mm, uh, nice. So, <laughs> you, You're writing this or you're reading it? I'm so, writing it. Oh, cool. That's great. It's a poem oh, I, as well. Oh, I and, think I'm... So I like, the, I like playing with that, the idea. And uh, I also like fantasizing, uh, frankly, about... Um, <clears throat> well, really, I mean, just... I guess I do have a thought. Uh, I mean, to me insofar as we are constituting some kind of I won't, I'm not going to call it a global brain I'm not sure that's the right metaphor I like the term Peter Sloterdijk used which is inter-intelligent and uh, insofar as that's part of what is growing uh, and it's not one thing it's more diverse it's more amorphous than that uh, then we need I think some filtering we need something just like a our brains pr- supposedly do filter all the potential raw sense data into a, a manageable, coherent, you know, actionable uh, perception. And to the extent that we are exposed to what's happening in the world as a whole all the time, I think it's going to be as kind of essential that we have some filtering mechanism so we don't have to do all the conscious thought to decide whether or not what we see. Uh, that's already being determined. Right? And it's being determined now by those who control or write the programs or algorithms for the AI, the big tech companies, the big, gov- big government. Uh, and I think that question is really the key question. Who, who controls it? Hmm. And the question of, I mean, we may not need to have another conversation about this, but the, the question of control, I think, comes to a question of ownership. Who owns it? Uh, one point that a futurist technology thinker, Jaron Lanier, makes is that, you know, to, to the biggest, to, the, to, to who has the strongest net, network goes the spoils. You gain that advantage and because you own it, then you get to control every, what happens on that network. And I see Cosmos and what we're doing here, honestly, as an alternative to that. And I know that there are many other people working on the same kind of thing. And to the extent that we can connect with each other, encourage each other's efforts, um, mm-hmm. support each other's efforts, like you're going to be doing, Caroline, at the Platform Co-op Conference this, this weekend, uh, I just I want to see more of that. Because to me, it's a matter of survival also. Like, if this goes in the direction of worst-case scenarios and you know, epic battles between different AIs and so forth, uh, we, we, need, we need an alternative that preserves the flame of liberation. That is, I hope, you know, lighting that space beyond uh, what appears to exist for us now. So I'll leave it at that. Really thank you all for being here. Adam, TJ, Caroline, John. Call me Caroline <laughs> when you get in New York. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think I have your number, but we should we should confer uh, over, over message on definitely. that. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to grab the title of the, um, Adam, your book, Permaculture. What was the title of that? Oh, yeah, it's called uh, Change Here Now. Okay. Recommended. 
All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Have a great night or night, day night. or wherever you are. <laughs> Time zone. <laughs> <laughs> well.